Hello everyone, welcome to chapter three, polynomial functions. Usually the first lesson in a chapter is a longer one because we have to go through a lot of the new characteristics for what we're gonna talk about. And I've put 3.1 and 3.2 together here because of the overlap. So this normally in class would take the entire period. So I have a bit of a nice background here to get you feeling relaxed so we can um, get into a good kind of learning mode for our new chapter here. Poly comes from a Greek word meaning much or many and nomial is name. So polynomial just means many terms. That's, that's the explanation we have for right now. So a polynomial function looks like this, right? You can have either a y or an f at x. So these are, uh, you can have a square root for a coefficient, um, but they, it has all x, uh, x values here that are um, have specific types of exponents. We're gonna talk about that. I know you have a handout that you hopefully have printed out and you're following along with your handout here. Beside each characteristic, write or sketch a non-example. That means something that's not a polynomial function. So the first characteristic, polynomial graphs do not have asymptotes. So these new functions we're gonna be talking about here, there's no asymptotes. A non-example would be the exponential. I put little uh, graph pictures in here of parent functions. They're really small, I know, but I just wanted to give you a little sketch so you could remember. So an exponential function has an uh, asymptote right there. So that's not polynomial. The next one here is also not polynomial, one over x. We've got asymptotes, vertical and horizontal asymptotes. So also those are not polynomial functions. So we won't be talking about those two functions during this chapter at all. Another characteristic of a polynomial function, so it can't have any asymptotes. Another is that the uh, exponents on the variables are whole numbers only. So for example, x to the power of negative one which is the same as, as one over x, right? These are the same. We can't have this, not only because there's asymptotes, but because we uh, can only have whole numbers for exponents. The square root of x, that's this graph here, that exponent is really x to the power of one half. So we can't have, we can't have either of these, they're not polynomial functions, we won't be studying them in chapter three. The third characteristic of polynomial functions is that their difference tables give us constant nth differences. That means if our second differences are the same, then it's quadratic. The exponent would be a two. If our uh, fifth differences were the same, it would have a power of five. So again, this is a power of one half, so that's another reason why it can't be polynomial. So again, we're not doing the radical function. The fourth one is they can only contain one variable. So here's the only one you know so far that has uh, more than one variable, and that's the circle. I had to kind of stagger my graphs here because I couldn't fit them all in these, these small spaces, so they're kind of staggered out. But this, the, this is a circle with a radius of one. The fifth characteristic is the domain, is x is an element of real numbers. So that's great. For this whole chapter, you don't have to think about the domain. That's always going to be the domain for all of our functions this whole chapter. Again, you can see this function here. Our uh, reciprocal function doesn't have x is an element of real numbers because in this one, x cannot equal zero. And the sixth one, is the range can be y is an element of real numbers, it may have an upper bound, it may have a lower bound, but not both. So the sine wave has an upper bound and a lower bound on the range. So the range for the sine wave is from negative one, less than or equal to y, to positive one. So, so uh, polynomial functions won't have both. They might have a lower bound, like think of a parabola, parabola that opens up would have a lower bound, but it wouldn't also have an upper bound. So we're not going to be doing good news for a lot of you. We're not going to be doing any sinusoidal functions, this graph, because they don't fit the characteristics of what a polynomial is. And our last characteristic, polynomial graphs must have end behavior, remember that, of y approaching positive or negative infinity. That means the end of the graph has to be going up 
or down. It has to be going up really high, up, 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 up to positive infinity or coming down really lo down low to negative infinity. So a non-example of that is the Coase wave. The Coase wave has n behavior that is going, uh, is oscillating. It's going up, down, up, down, up, down, but it never goes to infinity. And lots of these other graphs meet that criteria. This, of course, doesn't, um, this end behavior on the exponential graph on this side, it is approaching inf infinity, it's approaching zero. The right side's approaching y values are approaching positive infinity, they're getting higher and higher, but the y values on this side are just getting closer to zero. So none of these graphs that you see here are, are um, polynomial functions. We are not gonna be talking about them this chapter. So the general form of a polynomial function looks like this. It's kind of confusing to look at. I'm not going to, uh, you're not going to see this very often. I'm not going to talk about this too much. Your coefficients are all real numbers, right? That These a's can, are all uh, coefficients. They can be any kind of real number. And uh, n is a whole number, meaning if my first one is x to the power of this n here, it can only be um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, um, it can't be a negative or positive. We talked about that on the last slide. We can't have, ne sorry, it can't be a negative or um, a negative or a fraction or a decimal. We only have whole numbers here. This is a really important term, the degree. The degree is the highest exponent in the polynomial expression. If the polynomial is not expanded, so if it was factored, it wasn't expanded, then we would add the exponents of the highest powers as if you were expanding them to determine the degree. So right here in factored, this is factored form because it's all in brackets here. Just imagine expanding, distributing, this is the highest power in the first bracket and negative x to the power of seven is the highest power in the second bracket. If I multiply these two together, the exponent I would get would be a nine. So my degree here, the degree of this expression is a nine. That means the highest exponent you would get. And we just figure that out by taking the highest ones and multiplying them together. If it's in standard form, then we don't have to expand. We can just look at it. So the degree is nine. So this word degree doesn't mean anything like, a, like the degrees in a circle, 360 degrees. It's not that. It's not a degree like a temperature degree is, you know, 20 degrees. It's not degree like what you're going to get when you graduate. It's a different meaning for the word degree. Leading coefficient is also an important one. The leading coefficient is the coefficient, which is the number in the front, right? It's the attached to the variable that has the highest exponent. So in this one, again, if we had distributed these two together, the, that they're the highest ones, we multiply them together, we would get a degree, a uh, leading coefficient of negative three. If I multiplied these two together, that would be a negative three. So that's what leading coefficient and degree are very important bits of terminology. For these functions, um, we're going to fill in the chart. Now we should be able to visualize them without accurately drawing them. We'll put little sketches on here, but um, but we're going to try and get through this. I'm not going to draw these accurately. We should be able to come up with pretty good ideas. So the first one is linear, right? When you look at that first equation, g at x is linear. A little sketch of that here. A little sketch of that would be, so it, this one would have a y-intercept of 3. It would have, a, it's a negative slope, so it would be coming down. Whoops. So it would be something like that. The leading coefficient is the number in the front, right? So the leading coefficient is negative 0.7. The degree is the highest exponent. So the highest exponent here, there's an invisible one right there. So the highest, the degree is a one. End behavior. End behavior as x approaches negative infinity and as x approaches infinity. So looking back to our, my little sketch that I did over here, as x approaches negative infinity, that's as x is going in this way, negative infinity. My graph for this one here would be, y would be approaching positive infinity because my y values are going up, up, up. 
So as x approaches negative infinity, imagine the graph going in this direction. As x approaches negative infinity, my y values are approaching positive infinity. So my y values approach positive infinity. And then the next one we're going to do is on the other side, as x approaches positive infinity, as x approaches positive infinity, what's our, what are our y values doing? So our x values get bigger and bigger and bigger. Our y values are way down here. We're, pro we're approaching negative infinity. So as x approaches positive infinity, our y values approach negative infinity. Number of turning points. A line has no turning points. It does not turn like a parabola. It only always goes in one direction. Number of zeros, how many times does it cross the x-axis? Once. And the symmetry, remember, even, odd, or neither symmetry. So how do we calculate that? You've got to think back to how we did that before. To calculate the symmetry, you can look at the graph, and you can visualize the graph. Imagine flipping it one way horizontally. So if I flip this horizontally, it would look like, it would look like this. Oops. It would be coming across like this. So there's, that's not even because it's not the same. Odd means flipping it back down again. So imagine this Y intercept here flipping down. It's not back on top of itself. So this one is neither. Neither. Next one, H of X. H of X, a little sketch of H of X here. Um, negative 14 plus x. So this has a y-intercept of negative 14. That's way down here somewhere. Let's just put a dot there. And the slope is 1, so it's going up like this. That's all I need. The leading coefficient, so I, I moved these around just to you know make sure you can figure it out here. The leading coefficient is always the number in front of the highest uh, x degree. So in front of here, we've got a 1. The leading coefficient is a 1. The degree, again, in front of the x exponent is a 1. The end behavior is the other way this time. This time, as x approaches negative infinity, our y values are approaching negative infinity. And on the other side, as x approaches positive infinity, our y values are approaching positive infinity. Number of turning points, a line does not turn. Number of zeros, it's got to have one. It's got to cross once. There's no way a line, unless it's horizontal, which we're not considering right now, there's no way a line will not cross the x-axis. And symmetry for this one again. So if you wanted to try the, um, if you remember, you would sub in negative you could sub in a negative and for x if you want to do it algebraically, but it's pretty straightforward to look at it. I can see it's definitely not even. Even would be would be these two graphs looking the same and they don't, so it's not even. And if I flip it vertically, I take the y-intercept, put it up here. No, it's not going to be odd either, so it's neither. Next one is a quadratic. It's leading coefficient. So the leading coefficient in this one is a negative 3. Oh, I forgot. Did I forget to put the 1 there? should be a 1 there. Um, the leading coefficient is a negative 3. The degree is the exponent, the highest exponent if you expanded it all out. But you can tell, you should know that we've done so much work with quadratics that I've expanded that out into standard form. The highest exponent would be a 2. The end behavior, okay, so maybe I need a little sketch for this. The end behavior, this is a quadratic that opens down and it has a vertex at 2, 0. So here's 2, 0, opens down. So it's end behavior as y approaches negative infinity. So on the left hand side of my parabola, as x approaches negative infinity, sorry, my y is approaching negative infinity. That's a negative there. And on the right-hand side of my parabola, it's also going down. So it's also negative infinity on both sides. Number of turning points, parabolas turn once. They have one vertex. Number of zeros, well, this one just has one zero. 
it has one root or one x-intercept. Symmetry. All parabolas do have symmetry. Every parabola can be folded in half along the axis of symmetry, and it's symmetric. But this symmetry that we're talking about is what, what we learned about back in uh, chapter one. This is even, odd, or neither. This is not symmetrical. If I, if I flipped it over horizontally, it would look like this. So it, that's not even. If I flipped it vertically, it would be like this. So this has neither symmetry. It has an axis of symmetry, but that's that's different. That's not what this kind of symmetry means. The next one we're going to do is also a parabola. Its leading coefficient is 1 half. Its degree is 2. Its end behavior. Okay, so we don't Hopefully we can visualize these graphs so I don't have to graph them all the time. I can tell that it's opening up. So if it's opening up my end behavior, both ends of the parabola, if it's opening up, are both going to be y is approaching positive infinity on both ends. Right? If you need a sketch, you can give yourself a sketch. It's got a uh, it's got a y-intercept of positive six, so it's like this. Number of turning points, of course, probably has one. Number of zeros, this one doesn't have any zeros. And does this one have any symmetry? So let's first imagine flipping it horizontally. It does. If I if I reflect this horizontally through the y-axis, I'm going to have even symmetry. Even symmetry means that the original function is equal to um, taking uh, the negative x value, subbing in a negative there. They would be equal. That's what even symmetry is. Okay, next one is uh, another quadratic. The leading coefficient is a negative 1. The degree, again, is a 2. The end behavior, this one, is opening down. So both of them are going down. It's like the green one. So I'm going to have y approaches negative infinity. And on the other side, y is also approaching negative infinity because it's going down. Quadratics have one turning point. Number of zeros. So can you figure this one out without a sketch? Or do you need a sketch? Let's do a little sketch here. This one has a vertex of 7, 1. So let's say that's over here, 7, 1 and it's opening down. So how many zeros is it going to have? It's going to have two. Now does this one have any symmetry? If it had a horizontal symmetry, which is even, it would look like this, but it doesn't. When I flip it over, it's, it's on the other side. It doesn't land on top of itself. If it had odd symmetry, then when I do the vertical and the horizontal, they land back on each other, but they won't. So this one's also neither. And our last one is a quadratic two. So this quadratic leading coefficients, this is one where we're gonna, it's, it's like the one I set up here in the green uh, font. If the polynomial is not expanded, so we're in this case, you can imagine expanding this here. If I expanded the, oops, if I expanded this, the two, in the first one, the 2x is, it has the highest degree, the highest exponent, and in the second bracket, it's the 5x. So if I just distributed those two there, I would get a leading coefficient of 10. My degree, again, expanding those two is squared. So this is a parabola that has zeros. One of them, this first bracket gives me a zero at x equals three halves. And this one gives me a zero at x equals negative one fifth. So if I just put those on there, I've got a zero at negative one fifth and a zero at three halves. Let's just say that's there. And it's opening up. Oops. So the end behavior, both ends 
this end and this end are both going up. Parabolas are always like that. They have the same end behavior on both sides. Y is approaching infinity, positive infinity on both sides. Number of turning points, it's got one. Number of zeros, this one has two. And the symmetry, no, this one has neither symmetry. We're only going to get symmetry on a parabola if it's like the um, light blue one where the vertex is right on the y-axis. Then we're going to get some symmetry. Okay, important stuff in that chart there. So make sure you've got it all filled out correctly. Um, yeah, so let's skip ahead to the next slide here. For the polynomial function uh, given, I'm going to have to read it all off for you, state the leading coefficient, the degree, all this stuff here. So this is the equation, and this is the graph that matches it. First of all, the leading coefficient. So it's given to you in the question. The leading coefficient is the number that's in front of the highest degree exponent. So x to the power of 4 is our highest degree. So I can actually put that in there. My degree is a 4. The leading coefficient is the number in front of that. So that's a 2. The number of turning points. This one turns here. There's a turning point. There's another one, and there's another one. This one has three turning points. It's end behavior. So imagine there are arrows here. This graphing feature didn't put arrows in, but just imagine there's an arrow there and an arrow there. The end behavior. So this one, like a parabola, it has the same end behavior. Both ends are going in the same direction. So I can kind of write that in short form. I can say, as x approaches positive or negative infinity, doesn't matter if my x values are approaching positive infinity in this way or my x values are approaching negative infinity over this way, wherever I am on the graph, it's always going up. So as x approaches positive or negative infinity, my y values are also approaching positive infinity. Number of zeros. This one has one, two x-intercepts there. And the symmetry, so we can hopefully visualize that and we can see that our function that's drawn is not equal to flipping it horizontally along the y-axis. Those would not be the same. And that would not be the same as flipping it vertically and horizontally, right? Remember that odd is both of these. Um, you flip them both and they uh, land where they were. So this has neither symmetry. This is called a quartic function. Quartic is when your exponent is a four. It's a quartic. So it, it has a, it's kind of like a parabola, but it has a few more bumps in the middle. Quartic degree 4 means it could actually have four zeros. It could cross the x-axis four times, but this one only crosses twice. But it has this weird kind of W shape that could cross four times. So other quartics, if I'll just draw a little sketch for you here, you could also have, you could also have quartics like this, kind of like that is a quartic. You could also have quartics that open down. Um, like that. So an M or a W kind of shape, those are quartics. Given number two, given the polynomial function in its graph, 1 fifth x cubed, state the leading coefficient. Leading coefficient, there's only one coefficient here, so it's 1 fifth. The degree is the highest exponent, in this case it's a 3. Number of turning points, so we can't tell that from the equation, but we can look at the graph. If you look at the graph, it almost looks like it turns, but it doesn't. This graph is always increasing. So it's going up here, going up. It's still going up, but just barely. But it still is going up. So it's always increasing. It never goes from increasing to decreasing. It never actually turns. This one has no turning points. This one does not turn. 
it's this point is called the point of inflection actually where um, right here when it doesn't really turn like that but it kind of changes its um, rate of change so that's got no turning point there um, it has another way to tell that it is it has no no max or min right it doesn't it doesn't have a lo local minimum or a local maximum it just keeps going in the same direction the end behavior so let's start with this end here starting with this end as x approaches negative infinity so as this graph keeps going down to negative infinity in this direction as x approaches negative infinity our our graph is going down so our y is also or our y values are also approaching negative infinity on the other side as x approaches positive infinity that's up here as x approaches positive infinity our y values are also approaching positive infinity they're getting higher number of zeros kind of hard to tell because we don't have a lot of experience with this cubic yet we will learn more about cubics as we go on but right now um, the number of zeros this cubic only has one zero it only is crossing at zero zero that's the only place this one is crossing and the symmetry so the symmetry it says down here on the bottom the graphs of all cubics have point symmetry so any cubic let me just draw another one over here let me draw a cubic like this um, there's a cubic right it has some symmetry if I put kind of a uh, imagine me just putting like a thumbtack in right there in the center and spinning it around if I did spin it around it would land if I spun it 180 degrees in this direction here it would land back on itself as cubics do but for symmetry we have it has to be around the origin so if you're thinking of that thumbtack thing if I put a thumbtack in right here and I spun this around 180 degrees would it land on top of itself yes it would so this one has symmetry it has odd symmetry another way to think of odd symmetry remember is that you take your original function and you flip it you flip it horizontally that would be like this if I flipped it horizontally and that's equal to so if I take my original function I flip it horizontally and that's equal to flipping it vertically that would be that's our odd symmetry so cubics can also have um, more of a, a bend to them they can they can have turning points so a cubic can go like this and it could have three zeros actually but this one only has one but cubics can be stretched like this and they can bend a bit more our next two given the polynomial function in its graph n of x okay this one looks like a parabola it looks a lot like a parabola it's not and the reason I know it's not is well first of all I have an equation that tells me it's not I have an equation I can see the degree in the equation is a 4 it's not a quadratic but when I look at the graph it's kind of flattened at the vertex which our parabolas are not so that's a that's an indicator to me that is, is a this is a quartic function like the one we saw before so it's like that W or M shape but we've flattened out the middle part the leading coefficient is negative 0 0.1 number of turning points so this one it um, it's a quartic it this one's only turning once we can have quartics remember we can have quartics that are like this right and they would have more turning points but this one's had the middle part flattened out and behavior and behavior of quartics so I'm drawing arrows in here and here quartic end behavior it's the same as parabolas they have the same end behavior both ends go in the same direction so I can use that kind of shortcut as x approaches positive or negative infinity because they're both going in the same direction 
In this one, my y is approaching negative infinity. It's opening down. And that negative value at the front of the leading coefficient tells me it's opening down. If I didn't have a picture, I would know that anyway. Number of zeros, this one's got two. And the symmetry, so does this one have symmetry? Does the function, imagine flipping it horizontally through the y-axis. Hopefully you can do that. Uh, yes, it does. So my function is equal to making all my x values negative. So that means I've got even symmetry for this one. Um, and it has, this one has a, a turning point. It has an absolute maximum. It doesn't have an absolute minimum though. Number four, given the, this polynomial function, we're on m at x here, leading coefficient. Okay, this one I gave to you in factored form, so we're going to have to think a little about the leading coefficient. We're going to have to do some distributing to figure it out, so i got to take the highest degree in each bracket. That's this one, multiply it by this one, multiply it by this one. So if you just multiply those three things together in your head, you'll get your leading coefficient, which is a negative 2. The degree, again, you take those three that we've multiplied together, and you've got, there's 1x here. We multiply it by these two. That's going to now give me three x's. Another two, that gives me a degree of 5. Turning points, this one does turn right here. So this function is coming down, it's decreasing, and then it turns and it's increasing for a little bit, and then it's decreasing again. So we've got a turning point roughly here and here. We've got two turning points. End behavior. So let's start with this end here on the left. On the left-hand side, as x approaches negative infinity, negative infinity, what are our y values doing? Our y values are getting bigger and bigger. They're approaching positive infinity. Then on the right side, as x approaches negative infinity, as we move to the to the right, sorry, positive infinity, our y values approach negative infinity. The number of zeros we have in this one, we can tell from the picture there's just one. The symmetry, what do you think? Imagine flipping it first um, horizontally, so that would be something like like this, if we flipped it horizontally. That's not the same, so it's definitely not even. Now imagine flipping it vertically. Flipping it vertically would not be the same as the dotted line I put in there. So there's no symmetry there. And this one, since it's degree 5, is called a quintic function because it's degree 5. Everything after that, we just say, you know, the function of degree six or degree seven, but up until five, we have words for them. So linear is degree one, quadratic is degree two, degree, degree three is cubic, degree four is quartic, and degree five is quintic. Oh, yeah, next slide. Oh, this part here, important, yes, odd degree. When you have an odd degree like the one we just did, like the quintic that we just did, the end behaviors of an odd degree, like a degree of 3, a 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, if you have an odd degree, I'm not talking about symmetry, I'm talking about the degree. If the degree is odd, then the end behaviors are always opposite each other. One end up, one end down, just like this one. One end up, one end down. Anytime you have a degree that is an odd number, you're always going to have opposite end behavior. One end up, positive infinity, one end down. If you have an even degree, like the quadratic, the function's end behavior are the same. Both ends are up or both ends are down. So this is an even number here. The degree is a 4. So in this case, we've got both ends down. So even degrees are always going to be like this. Same end behavior. You can use that shortcut. Odd degrees are going to give you uh, two different end behaviors. So let's talk a little bit about, I think if you've got the handout, I think you're on the second page here, 
I expanded this into a whole a whole slide. I didn't need to, but I'm going to go over it kind of quickly. When you have a table of values, when you look at the y values, if the y values have a common ratio, then it's exponential. So here's an example of that. I just I haven't done any first differences or anything. I'm just dividing. I have I know my function's exponential. First differences. If the first differences are constant, you remember this, first differences are constant, the function's linear. So if you've gone and done the first differences and they're not, or, okay, so they're not constant, but you see that they have a common ratio, then you're back to exponential again. So this one is linear. First differences are the same, it's linear. Second differences are the same, it's quadratic. Again, um, you can still see they're exponential if they don't work out that way. But if your second differences are the same, then you've got a quadratic. And in general, those are called finite differences, all those differences, or difference tables in general, if the nth differences are positive. So let's look at this one here. The second, in this case, the second differences are positive. Then the leading coefficient, so for this quadratic right here, the leading coefficient would be positive. It wouldn't be 10 necessarily, but it would be a positive, so it would open up. So we can tell that from this, even if we don't have an equation, and we don't have a graph, we're just looking at a table, we can tell that it's going to open up because these differences, same thing here, these differences, the first differences were positive. So this one is going to be a line, but it's going to be a line going up in that direction. If the leading coefficient is negative, then the, if the leading coefficient is negative, then the nth differences will be negative. So it works positive or negative. Example 1a, so we're going to talk about some finite differences here. We've got a cubic function and we're going to complete the table of values for the cubic function here. So we've got a graph and you've got a table and you've got an equation, you've got everything. Recall from chapter 2 that the slope of a secant represents the average rate of change from one point to the next. Remember that? So we're going to put on a column here to calculate first differences showing the rate of change. Uh, first of all, there's, let me get these coordinates in here. So this, I have this out of order, sorry, but I'm not going back and re-recording this. First, let's complete the table of values. So here I've just subbed in a negative 3 right into the x, watch the negatives. Negative three cubed is negative 27. I still have a negative in front. So my answer, two negatives make a positive is 27. So I have the coordinate negative three, 27 up here somewhere. Sub in a negative two, sub in a negative two. Be very careful with your signs, we get an eight here. So you can press pause if you want uh, and finish the table. I'm gonna go ahead and show you all the answers. There's the whole table of values done that matches this cubic. Now let's do the first differences. So the first differences, remember they're calculated by subtraction. I take this y2, which is an 8, and I subtract y1. So I'm doing 8 subtract 27 here my first first difference I get a negative 19 um, yeah I just erased that I didn't I didn't have much room so I just erased that so I've got negative 19 next one 1 subtract 8 is going to give me a negative 7 0 subtract 1 remember to always go in the right order here 0 subtract 1 it's giving us a negative 1 so why don't you press pause and finish this yourself and when you press play again, they'll be finished for you here. Okay, definitely we do not have, this is not linear. You can tell by looking at it, right? Normally you wouldn't also be given the graph. I just gave you the graph so we can put all the pieces together that we're learning here. Normally I wouldn't give you this graph. I may not even give you the equation, just a table. And you do your first differences and so it's not linear. So let's go back down now here to this part here. So um, the slope of the secant, so that means the, the slope between two points, any two points like we just did here, show you the average rate of change from one point to the next. These are average rates of change, the first differences. 
This is showing you the rate of change of the function. That's what my numbers that I wrote in black are. The first differences are not constant, right? It's not linear, but they should all have the same sign. They do. All of my first differences are negative. What do you think this means? What do you think it means that the first differences are all negative when we kind of put it together with rate of change? If all of my calculations are negative, I subtract my y values, I get negatives all the time. They're all negative, so that means the y values are decreasing as the x values increase. That means from left to right, right? Always reading from left to right in this direction. That means the rate of change slopes are negative between the pairs. So this is a decreasing function. That's what this means. It's always decreasing because it's always negative. We're always, if I drew, if I drew two lines anywhere between two points on here, it doesn't matter where. I go from, put a point here, put a point here, draw a, if I can here with this pen, Oh, nope. Try again. Okay, that's a pretty terrible line. I'm not even going to tell you how many times I had to erase that to get that for you guys. Okay, let's pretend that's a nice straight line. So what I was saying was it's a decreasing function. You put two points on the line anywhere. You draw a slope line. It's always going to be negative. It's, that's, what this, that's what the first differences are telling you there. So that ties us in with chapter two. Next question, add on another column and calculate the second differences. They're not constant either. So I already gave you kind of the answer, but let's put on a second column here. Okay, we've got our second differences column here and it works the same as before. So this one would be negative seven, subtract negative 19. And I'm going to erase that in a second so that I can have my numbers all in a nice row. But that's going to be the same as negative 7 plus 19. So that's going to be a 12. So go ahead and do all the second differences and press pause. Come back when you're done. So there's all of our second differences. They're not, it's not quadratic, right? I could tell that by the equation. I could tell it by the graph. It's clearly not quadratic. Um, but they do tell us something about the graph. What do you think it is? So I'm going to imagine you giving me the right answer here. What do you think it is? What did these, what did the second differences tell us? They do give us a clue. They're positive and then negative. They're positive. We don't count zero, but they're positive and then negative. Therefore, the graph is concave up, then concave down. The point where concavity changes is the point of inflection concave up so that right here if I if I just continue imagine this not even imagine the it's stopping there and I just had a parabola that's concave up this whole section here concave up then once we our second differences change we've got concave down here right this is concave down so where it changes right here at zero, this is our point of inflection. D, now look at the third differences. What did they tell us about the function? Okay, third differences. So we're gonna put another column on here. You're gonna press pause and you're gonna go ahead and do all that. And let me just point out that I keep putting my little difference headings down a little lower each time because every time I do a difference, I'm. I'm just kind of compressing it a bit. You don't need to do that, but that's why it's a little lower. Okay, so now you're going to subtract just like we did before. This is 6 subtract 12. That's uh, negative 6, and then you're going to continue on like that. Oh, Kel surprise. Finally, um, we have constant differences, constant finite differences. Our third differences are all the same. Now look at the third differences. What did they tell us about the function? Okay, you have an answer in your head. I'm reading your mind. The third difference is, remember this characteristic from the polynomial functions chart at the start of the lesson. Difference tables yield constant nth differences. So this is a characteristic of polynomial functions. So if the second differences are constant, it's quadratic. So in this case, our third differences are constant. So this will have, every time you have a polynomial function, at some point, your differences are going to work out. If we had degree, if we had a degree 
five here, our fifth differences would be constant. That's what this characteristic is telling you here. So the third differences are constant, therefore the degree of the function is three. That's what we're getting out of all these differences. So on a quiz or a test, I would not expect you to go to a fifth level. That just takes too long. You do a few and you show me you know what it means. But um, that's we do learn something from each. It's not a waste. We do learn something from each part of the difference tables. For any cubic function, this is a cubic. Determine the maximum and minimum number of zeros. So this is a cubic, but remember we can have all kinds of cubics. A cubic could also look like, like this. It could come up, turn around. That's not supposed to be as uh, straight as it is there, but we could have something like that. We could have a cubic like, um, like this. All right. These could be cubics. So the maximum and minimum number of turning points. The maximum number of turning points for any cubic function is going to be two. The maximum it can turn is twice, like these one, this one that I drew in black here, these ones can turn twice. But we can also have zero, such as the one we have here. This one doesn't actually turn, it's always decreasing. Remember this, always decreasing. So the um, minimum number of turning points is zero. It can be zero, it maximum could be two. The number of zeros or x-intercepts, that's the same as the degree. Whatever your degree is, that's the maximum you can have. If I give you a polynomial function with degree 27, it means it could cross the x-axis 27 times. That's the maximum it could have. Now, for a cubic, it's got to cross once. There's no way to draw a cubic function that would not cross because it has opposite end behavior, one end up, one end down, it's going to have to cross the x-axis somewhere. So as long as it's an odd degree, such as a cubic, the minimum number of zeros you're going to have is one. It's going to have to cross once. This would not be a zero. Example two. This is our last one. Finally, we're already at 47 minutes. Example two. For each of the following functions, decide if it has an even or odd degree or the, if the coefficient is positive or negative. Okay, let's get through this one here. If you want to press pause and go ahead and write down all your answers below the graphs or beside the graphs, that's what I'm going to do here. You can press pause um, and try it out yourself and I will go through the answers now. For the first one, does the function have an even or odd degree? So the first part's asking even or odd degree. Because it has opposite end behavior, I know it has an odd degree. It could be an exponent 3, it could be a degree 3, it could also be a degree 5, it could look like that. Um, it doesn't matter, I'm just asking if it's odd or even. The other part of this question is asking if the leading coefficient is positive or negative. So this, from left to right, is increased. turns around a little bit here, that's okay, but overall it's an increasing function. Overall it's going up. That means its leading coefficient is positive. Next one. Is it an even or odd degree? Let's look at the end behavior. One end up, one end down. So even or odd degree. This one also has an odd degree. And is the leading coefficient positive or negative? So it's starting high. It's starting up high and it's doing, you know, it's turning around a little bit, but it's coming down low. Overall, it's it's a decreasing function. It's going down. It's got a little bit of turning around in the middle, but overall it's starting high and coming low, which means the leading coefficient must be negative. Next one. We've got leading coefficient even or odd degree. Look at your end behavior. It's got the same end behavior, so it's got to be an even degree. It's got to be a 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. And because it's opening up like a parabola, always think of a parabola when you have these even degree ones. It's like a parabola, so the leading coefficient must be positive if it's opening up. Next one. Put some arrows on here. 
This also has the same end behavior, so its degree must be even. And its leading coefficient, this one, like a parabola, imagine we had a parabola on here. Like going down like that, we would know that the leading coefficient would be negative to make it turn down. So that's like a negative, um, uh, negative leading coefficient. This one over here would be like a parabola that was opening up. It's got a positive leading coefficient. Okay, 50 minutes. Um, homework summarize everything from sections 3.1 and 3.2 in your notes. So go through the textbook, read through it. You're going to have lots of extra stuff in there that's going to help you. Second time through is always better than the first time through. So go through it. Do lots of practice questions. Pick the ones you need to work on. Don't forget to check your answers at the back of the book. New chapter, fresh start. And there is a typo. So good work. That was a long lesson, a lot of characteristics. Um, go through it again, of course, if you want to, but go ahead and start on the homework and watch the sections of the video again if you need to.